SpaceX has completed all pre-launch tests for Starship's highly anticipated third integrated flight test and has announced a launch date and time. Meanwhile, preparations are already underway for the next ship in line, Starship 29, as it gears up for static fire testing. Additionally, groundwork has begun for the construction of the second launch tower at Starbase. Join us as we delve into the heart of these latest developments. SpaceX has successfully concluded the wet dress rehearsal of Starship 28 Booster 10 full-stack vehicle, the final test before launch. Initially attempted a month ago, the wet dress rehearsal faced two back-to-back -back aborts due to issues with propellant loading. Consequently, the launch vehicle underwent destacking, followed by a thorough inspection and repair of the launch pad infrastructure, especially the quick disconnect mechanisms, over the ensuing weeks. After fixing all the known issues and testing the launch pad structures to verify their operations, the full stack returned on March 1. Two days later, on March 3, SpaceX proceeded with the integrated launch vehicle's wet dress rehearsal. A wet dress rehearsal is usually performed to simulate a launch day scenario. It involves fully loading propellants into the rocket, followed by a launch countdown rehearsal, except for the ignition of the rocket's engines. The test on Sunday began by loading propellants into the booster. Propellant pumping into Ship 28 began when the methane and oxygen tanks of Booster 10 were partially loaded. Within approximately 45 minutes, both the ship and the booster were fully loaded with cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen. The vehicle remained in this state for an hour, enabling mission control to conduct launch day procedures, including countdown and all system checks. Both Starship and booster engine chill were also conducted during the countdown rehearsal. A fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system test was conducted towards the end of the countdown. The system is designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, mitigating the risk of volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen accumulation. Usually, the FireX is activated 10 seconds before engine ignition. So, it can be concluded that the countdown reached the T-minus 10-second mark during the wet dress rehearsal. Both the ship and the booster were detanked later, concluding the wet dress rehearsal. The wet dress rehearsals for the first two integrated flight tests, conducted last year, demanded nearly 90 minutes to fully load the launch vehicles with propellants. Yet, in a remarkable feat, the latest rehearsal saw Booster 10 and Ship 28 being fueled in just about 45 minutes, a significant improvement in fuel loading time. The swift and seamless fuel loading was made possible by the newly installed heat exchangers and pumps at the tank farm. The fuel loading time will improve in the future, reducing turnaround times and allowing for faster launch schedules. After the wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX posted on X that the test was a success and the launch vehicle was loaded with more than 10 million pounds of propellant during the test. Ship 28 was destacked from Booster 10 on March 5 for final finishing touches ahead of launch. Teams were spotted working on the thermal protection system tiles of the ship, conducting a last round of inspections, fixes, and replacements. Tiles fell from the ships during both the first and second integrated flight tests. Let's hope they will remain attached to Ship 28 during all stages of Flight 3. The grid fins of Booster 10 were tested after the D-stack, ensuring their flawless operation during the booster's atmospheric re-entry. Concurrently, workers removed scaffolding from the Starship Quick Disconnect arm and performed final inspections on the Quick Disconnect mechanism. Once all the checks and inspections are complete and SpaceX receives a launch license from the FAA, the flight termination system charges will be installed on the launch vehicle, and it will be armed. The system is designed to destroy the rocket by triggering an explosion, in case the launch vehicle goes out of control during its flight. The final full stack will take place after FTS installation. SpaceX officially announced on their website that they are targeting March 14, also recognized as Pi Day, for Starship Flight 3. The launch window opens at 11.30 a.m. GMT, or 6.30 a.m. Texas time. A local notice to Mariners which includes hazard zones for a Starship launch on March 14 has also been released. Additionally, NASA has reserved March 14 for its WB-57 aircraft, which tracks Starship launches. The aircraft's ability to fly at altitudes exceeding 60,000 feet provides an advantageous vantage point for tracking and observing the Starship's trajectory, contributing valuable data for mission monitoring and post-flight analysis. Although the launch date is set, SpaceX must fulfill all 17 corrective actions identified during the Flight 2 mishap investigation to secure the launch license from the FAA. Given SpaceX has set a date for Flight 3, it's likely that they have already implemented all the corrective actions and submitted necessary information to the FAA for review. The launch license for Flight 2 was obtained just three days before launch, so we can expect the license for Flight 3 anytime soon. 
However, any delays in obtaining the license or unforeseen circumstances could result in a postponement of the launch from March 14 to a later date. Integrated Flight Test 3, or IFT-3, continues SpaceX's ongoing iterative method for advancing Starship. It involves flying as much as possible and getting through as much of its mission profile as it can. Extensive data collected during the test flights will help refine Starship design for future missions. The flight profile and mission objectives of IFT-3 feature several updates compared to the first two integrated flight tests. Everything from liftoff to stage separation and reaching orbit is similar to the first two launches. Once Ship 28 reaches orbit, it will perform a payload bay test by opening and closing the payload bay door. This is a rehearsal for future missions that will deploy Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. A propellant transfer demonstration will also be performed during IFT-3. The propellant transfer demo, funded by a $53.2 million NASA contract, requires moving 10 metric tons of liquid oxygen between the main tank and the header tank, while the Starship is coasting in orbit. Following a successful tank-to-tank -tank demonstration, SpaceX will attempt a ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer between two Starships connected in low Earth orbit. These demonstration missions will give NASA and SpaceX enough data to improve propellant transfer technology, which is crucial for the agency's Artemis missions. Additionally, Ship 28 will also conduct the first-ever reignition of a Raptor engine while in space. This is a significant step, as during future missions, Starship will need to reignite the Raptor engines multiple times for trajectory corrections, entering lunar or Mars orbit, and performing deorbit and landing maneuvers. Multiple in-space reignition tests, like the one that will be performed during the next test flight, will give SpaceX valuable data to access the Raptor engine performance and improve its design for future missions. Upon completing all the in-space demonstrations, Ship 28 will undergo a controlled atmospheric re-entry, culminating in a splashdown in the Indian Ocean roughly an hour after liftoff. This differs from the previous two integrated flight tests, which planned splashdowns off the coast of Hawaii. According to SpaceX, this new flight path enables them to attempt new techniques like in-space engine burns while maximizing public safety. A notice to air missions for a potential Starship splashdown in the Indian Ocean between March 14 and March 18 has been released lately. Hopefully, SpaceX will successfully accomplish all mission milestones throughout IFT-3. Ship 28's successor, Starship 29, with all six Raptor engines installed, was rolled out to the launch site for static fire testing on February 29. Subsequently, it was lifted and placed atop suborbital launch pad B for static fire preparations. Road closure schedules suggest that Starship 29's static fire test may occur prior to Starship Flight 3. On March 4, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission unanimously approved a contentious deal granting SpaceX several acres of Boca Chica State Park, despite overwhelming objections from South Texas residents and others. SpaceX will receive 43 acres of land at Starbase, and in return, the state will get 477 acres near the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge, an area the commission has been interested in for many years because it's one of the most biologically diverse regions in North America. The green shaded areas on this map illustrate the land that would be transferred to SpaceX, while the orange area represents Boca Chica State Park. After revealing the land transfer plan ahead of its January meeting, the Parks and Wildlife Commission received several public responses and letters, most of them opposing the deal. The Commission's approval of the land swap is just a first step. An environmental assessment, anticipated to take up to 18 months, and approval from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are required before finalization. As per the latest reports, the transferred land at the launch site is slated for the construction of the second orbital launch tower and associated infrastructures. Groundwork for Tower 2 construction is already underway. It looks like they have already begun the piling work. Tower 2 will replace the old suborbital launch pad, which currently serves as a test stand for Starship static fire testing. Consequently, static fire testing of Starship prototypes will be relocated to SpaceX's Massey's test site, located several kilometers from Starbase. The construction of the static fire test stand and a flame trench is already underway at Massey's. Upon completion, this test stand will closely resemble this graphics from Ryan Hansen Space. At the Starbase production site, the aft section of Booster 14 has been moved into the Mega Bay lately for stacking. The oxygen tank section of Booster 14 will be complete once the aft section joins the already stacked section. Methane tank stacking will begin next, followed by the integration of methane and oxygen tanks to complete Booster 14. Apart from Booster 14 sections, we have Boosters 11, 12, and 13 inside the Mega Bay. Starships 30 and 31 are inside the High Bay, 
while Ship 32, the final prototype of Starship Version 1, resides in the Rocket Garden. Ships from Starship 33 onwards will feature significant design upgrades and will be designated as Starship Version 2 prototypes. Those Version 2 vehicles will pave the way for even more advanced Version 3 iterations. Please check out the links in the description to learn about Starship V2s and V3s in detail. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. A SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft caught up with the International Space Station last week, bringing four astronauts to the outpost for a six-month stay. SpaceX launched the Crew 8 mission to the ISS atop a Falcon 9 rocket from Kennedy Space Center on Sunday, March 3. The Crew Dragon spacecraft Endeavour, making its fifth flight, was carrying three NASA astronauts and a Russian cosmonaut to the space station. Among the Crew 8 astronauts, NASA's Michael Barrett is the only member with previous space flight experience. The Crew Dragon Endeavour separated from the rocket's upper stage 12 minutes after liftoff and began its journey towards the International Space Station. Following a 28-hour orbital pursuit, on Tuesday, March 5, the spacecraft closed in on the ISS and eventually docked to the forward port of the Harmony module. After completing all the standard system checks, the hatches were opened, granting the astronauts access to the space station, where they were greeted by the seven-member Expedition 70 crew. Crew 8 marks SpaceX's 13th crewed flight overall and its eighth operational mission for NASA as part of the agency's commercial crew program. During their six-month stay aboard the ISS, the Crew-8 astronauts will engage in more than 200 scientific experiments and technology demonstrations in microgravity, including research that will support human exploration into deep space. Furthermore, they will relieve the four astronauts from SpaceX's Crew-7 mission, who arrived at the ISS in August 2023, and are scheduled to return to Earth no earlier than March 11. SpaceX launched more than 50 satellites into orbit on its latest transporter rideshare mission. The mission, dubbed Transporter 10, was launched from Vandenberg Space Force Base on Monday, March 4, atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The mission carried 53 small sats from a variety of customers. Payload deployment from the rocket's upper stage into two separate sun-synchronous orbits commenced nearly an hour post-launch and concluded approximately two hours and 33 minutes later. Atomos Space, a Colorado startup, launched Quark Light and Glue on spacecraft on Transporter 10. Gluon is designed to separate from quark in orbit and then serve as a target for rendezvous, docking, and refueling demonstrations. This mission will essentially demonstrate the method by which Atomos intends to deploy large satellite constellations and provide services such as relocation, life extension, and orbit raising. Space Machines Company, an Australian startup, launched Optimus 1, the largest commercial spacecraft ever constructed in Australia. The spacecraft is designed to demonstrate future orbital servicing technologies, such as life extension, on-orbit inspections and assistance to existing satellites. True Anomaly, based in Colorado Springs, launched its first two Jackal spacecraft, each weighing around 275 kilograms. These vehicles will perform rendezvous and proximity operations while taking multispectral imagery of each other. True Anomaly is targeting the defense market for missions such as space domain awareness and space operations training. The last payload deployed on Transporter 10 was Methanesat, developed by Ball Aerospace for the Environmental Defense Fund. This 366-kg spacecraft will monitor global methane emissions, concentrating on regions associated with oil and gas production. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas with over 80 times the warming power of carbon dioxide. Methanesat data will be made public so that companies, governments and advocates can speed up emissions cuts, track progress, and hold polluters truly accountable. Please check out the link in the description for the complete list of 53 satellites launched on the Transporter 10 mission. SpaceX advertises Transporter rideshare missions as a continuous opportunity for those wanting to launch smaller payloads into a variety of orbital inclinations. On its website, the company offers the service of delivering a 50 kg payload to a sun-synchronous orbit for $300,000, with additional mass charged at $6,000 per kilogram. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode.